Bueno, bienvenidos a Teorética. Eh, nuestro invitado de hoy es Christopher Cosíes, un artista de Trinidad y Tobago que fue invitado por Teorética en el marco del programa que tenemos de becas de emergencia, eh, que es eh, con, el, con el apoyo de Arts Collaboratory y Christopher. Eh, solo es artista, sino que también es escritor. Eh, nació y está basado en Trinidad y Tobago y su trabajo, digamos, ha sido muy eh, extensamente expuesto en diferentes partes del mundo, en galerías, en museos, en el de La Habana. Eh, recientemente tú abrió una exhibición con un tema similar, el Casmen en, en Múnich, y ha expuesto en varios espacios. Y también, a la par de su trabajo artístico, tiene el trabajo eh, de, de editor y es miembro del Consejo Editor de Small Acts, a Caribbean Journal of Criticism, y consejero de la revista BOM. También ha publicado varios ensayos que se, ha, se han publicado en diferentes revistas y eh, tiene además, con dos compañeros, dos colegas, fundó un espacio que se llama Alice Yard en Trinidad, que se dedica al arte contemporáneo y a actividades relacionadas con el performance, eh, donde llegan pues, diferentes artistas a participar, a comentar, que es un espacio bastante flexible. Y bueno, Christopher nos va a, ah, bueno, es, es, recibió el, príncipe, el premio Príncipe Claus en el 2003, y hoy nos va a hablar un poco sobre su trabajo en general, a, como a contextualizar la muestra que tenemos aquí, que se llama Enredo, que en la, los que la vieron en la sala contigua. Y eh, un poco hace referencia a los desafíos que presentan eh, las economías del sector. Entonces, los dejo en, con Christopher. Christopher, sí. Well, first of all, I, you know, of course, I want to thank um, you know, Sarah and Mark and all the people involved for the invitation to um, give a program to my um, I've always known of the achievements that I've had in the college of education in the engineer uh, in the mid 90s, you know, when students were giving for research and traveling, you know, in the Caribbean and stuff. Um, it's taken quite a while for this moment of even to be um, being here to present the work of my students and my teachers. So of course, thank you very much. You know, with you all. Uh, I have a PowerPoint to begin with. Of course, I will be presenting the moment of the PowerPoint to my I'll talk a little bit about a change in my history, uh, which is how it is right now. And then um, you know, I'll try to sort of jump back and forth between um, the work, the work that I do, the visual artist, and what the technical world around me is. So there's just one thing to do with that. I think the first project I'm going to share with you um, was done in 2003 in, in Copenhagen. And I think at the time, it, it, it sort of summed up something about where people or artists like myself um, working in and from the Caribbean often find ourselves. Um, I, I mean, to me, you know, when I say Caribbean, I, I rarely talk about, I mean, I'll backtrack a little bit, I mean, from a, from a basic point of view, I mean, the, the Caribbean is really a fiction, you know, um, and uh, when one is born in a place or lives in a place like the Caribbean, you're sort of living in this kind of perpetual, 
action. It's almost like it's almost like playing football, and you know the ball is delivered to you, and you have to do it. <laughs> you know, and um, and but it, but on the other side, you're, you're kind of in, in a kind of competition with this um, fiction, which is a product that really belongs to somebody else, um, and um, so that you you can coyly engage it or you can try to avoid it. Um, and, 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 and I think it gets really complicated in the sense that so much of the sort of canonical and sort of mainstream practices want to sort of use you know, geography to kind of put you in a specific location and then sort of preordain or define you know, how you should operate within that fixed position. And whether it's the multiculturalist enterprises or the ETs that you know, which sort of says to you something like, well, okay, you know, we have money for you to operate here, but the normal world is over here, and the money is bigger, or, or the critical ideas are more significant. So, um, from the very early stages of my career as a, a student living in the U.S. in the 80s, you know, you kind of found yourself in this position where it's so overdetermined that you don't, you don't quite, you constantly have to be sort of slightly a kind of dexterity, a question about dexterity. Um, so, um, in 2003, I got up, uh, I got invited to do this project in, in Denmark, and it was around the time, you know, the, all the conversations about the European Union, and common currency, but I think Denmark itself was going through a kind of shift to the right, and they wanted to bring these artists in from around the world to see if they could open up a conversation about diversity and complexity, globalization, international economy, whatever, however they were trying to frame it. Actually, it was in that project that I got to meet uh, Priscilla Mott and a number of other people who were invited. We were all placed in different cities. I decided that my project was called Terror Story. And uh, what I decided to do, it was at the Nicolas, and what I decided to do was wait until the spring was coming and to fence off all the benches in the park outside the museum and turn them into territories. And then I uh, had this line in my mind, this, this line of text in my mind, um, and to think they had me believing this all this time. And uh, what the text was about was that uh, on the way, I had to travel to Copenhagen a couple of times, and um, all kinds of problems came up because, of course, the curators asked me, oh, "Yes, just fly up to Copenhagen, and uh, you know, we'll discuss the project, and then we'll implement it over the next three, four months." And, um, but then I found out at that point in time that somebody coming from where I was coming from. Um, couldn't get a visa that quickly to go to Denmark. So the whole question of globalization, you know, what was coming up was, um, you know, like who gets the travel and who doesn't get the travel. So, you know, and under what kind of circumstances, right? So, you know, so it was about what visa do you have, the one in the passport or the one in your pocket, you know? And, um, and I never realized all these challenges. And when I was in the airport in London, there was this thing at the time about people in England have to learn to be more prone to accept what British is in. And then, of course, the weirdest thing happened to me is even though I had a letter of invitation and um, the museum that we had, you know, eventually got the visa after many negotiations. In the line in the airport in Copenhagen, even though I have these letters that say I'm an artist, I'm arriving, I'm coming to do the show, the visa officer shouts at me through the class, you know you can't stay and work. And I was thinking, well, why do you need to <laughs> But then you look around at the line, and that would be the first thing the line is going down. So the project kind of evolved because of those experiences. So what I did was I fenced off the benches in the park. And then when the spring came, nobody could um, sit on the bench. Where they could sit on the bench is if they came into the museum and filled out a form, like a visa form. They asked a lot of 
spurious question. And, um, and, and then, if I deem that it was okay for them to get a key to sit on a bench in the park, then I would give them this uh, key. If you can see the key, the key has a little plantation owner on it, and it has a number on the back. And then I made everybody an official owner man. And the owner man was allowed to open the key and sit inside this enclosure. But then, of course, the implied question was, well, why do you want to be out of open space in the occupied territory? Which brought up all kinds of questions about their identity and their place on the planet and the kind of relationship of small places like the Caribbean with the kind of colonial history and all that kind of thing. So, um, and then if I just decided I didn't like you and you can't get a key to sit in the bench, I had this image of a runaway slave from the you know, 18th, 19th century Carolinas. And I would stamp that on the application form. And of course, in a place like Jamaica, people were engaged. You know, I mean, sitting on a park bench and people could be in a strange room was almost like a right. And, um, and in the, the, the idea to do this came from an earlier project. Um, but what I want to go back to, well, I'll explain the images. Um, the image on the far right was an image that was in a historical textbook when I was a kid. You know, one of these typical man who controls territory. So what I decided is I made rubber stamps into all three of them. Um, the one in the middle is the standard runaway, and the third one was one that I made up myself, a guy running with a briefcase. And what I did is I called the one presiding over land and everything. I called him dinner takes all. The guy in the middle, I, I called him going north. And the guy running off with the briefcase, I called him, and to think he was such a polite boy. Um, it's kind of interesting that we are uh, returning to this particular vocabulary right now in the kind of, um, with all the FIFA stuff that's going on. And the main protagonist in it is this Jack Water guy from Trinidad. <laughs> so it's, and it's just occurring to me right now as I'm talking to you. It's quite funny. Um, so, or sad. That would sort of take you back to. And one of the centerpieces in the whole thing is that the benches are fenced off. And then I put this podium, you know, first, second, and third, in the park as well, with a fence around it. And the fence said, and to think, you know, um, you had me believing this all this time. And the premise behind it is that, you know, we are creating these enclosures, and I'm thinking about all these kinds of constructions of progress development, who's ahead in the race, who's behind in the race, you know, the kind of Hegelian constructions of history and all of that. And then I'm thinking, but if you fenced off and you're on the outside, then it means, what do you do? Do you then fight to break into this enclosure, break the barricade, so to speak, or are you then just free to embark on a narrative of, you know, your own choosing? I mean, that's a kind of important philosophical question, I would think, political and so on. So, um, so the project came in these, in these components that had been sort of like in the DNA of my past work. One of the fun pieces of it is that, um, you know, again, things come back, come up later in your practice, is that I started collecting these um, little cheap Chinese rulers that children get in the primary and kindergarten schools to learn systems of measurement. And I suspended 400 of these one, you know, one foot Chinese rulers between the two buttresses of this very old church. And I called the piece uh, 400 Years after the song by Peter Tosh, uh, talking about 400 years of slavery, but also talking about 400 years of anxiety about measurement. So even though the pieces had a kind of a sort of history in terms of the Caribbean context, I was really trying to riff on places like Denmark. You know, as well, which are small societies, kind of in a state of right-wing anxiety about being overwhelmed by the Franco-German economic dispensation. I mean, it's kind of interesting saying all these things right now because I have Jack in the audience, <laughs> and uh, you know, the crisis of Greece around the list. But um, that was 2003. One of the weirdest things that happened with projects like this is that I was invited to do it in Haiti, and then that brought up a whole chaos of what to do. Because the organizers in Haiti wanted to reconstruct this whole project on the uh, Chardimar. 
and I was like, what? You're going to pay security guards to guard a project, you know, about territory? And then, because the fear was that if we put this thing out on the Charlie Bar in the front, that um, people will run off with it. You know, a bit of chaos starts. You know, so that all the materials would disappear. So that I, I, the whole idea behind it was kind of extreme. But then what I decided to do is to move the project indoors. I don't have good, um, I've been trying to get good uh, documentation of that, but what I did is that the forms didn't make sense in Fort France either, because only people within a certain kind of context could fill out the forms, only people living in Pequenville or whatever. You know? So I decided, okay, if that's the case, then I will do a three card trick. So I actually went on the street and had three cards. One had the plantation owner, and the other two had the runaway. And then I would do that down and trick the street. And if you could trick me and I could trick you, then you get a key, right? And the interesting thing about Haiti is that I was thronged by people basically saying to me, what's the hustle? What's the trick? How do I get into the enclosure? I moved the enclosure inside of the museum with a lock and key, but I, I, made the, I borrowed the curator, who's a friend of mine, I borrowed the curator's um, garden furniture. Because, of course, you only have garden furniture if you live in Petroville. And I demanded that they would serve fresh croissants, wine, and face flowers every day inside of the enclosure. So if a regular person on the street outwitted me, got a key, got into the museum, they could then sit and have croissants and drink wine or whatever at a nice bar. And that's what you see. <laughs> But why it, was, why it became so perverse in terms of the difference of social environments is that Copenhagen people were arguing about the right to sit on the bench, the right to get there. In Port-au-Prince, it was what's the hustle? How do I get over? How do I get between the system? And then what, what was very interesting, and I don't mean any of this in a kind of comparative, disparaging way, is that Eventually, people broke in, and when I was walking around in Copenhagen at night, I found people sitting down on the bench, and just very mischievously, because they didn't know I was there, just, I would go to them at night and say, hey, you've got a key, how lucky. And then one night, a bunch of guys said to me, no, we are anarchists, we just broke into everything. So, you know, there was a whole kind of different relationship to the project. Both people who very politely locked themselves in and sat there with each other, which was absolutely ridiculous and other people who basically broke in at night and drank and broke in and whatever. But then in Haiti, what happened is very often people would come in, get a key, and come every day. And this one guy fascinated me because he would come with friends. And then what he would do is when he got in, he would open up, bring his kid, sit down, have the wine. But if he came with another friend, he would say to the friend, hey, you don't have a key, I have a key. So then he would sit down and leave the friend outside and then like start and look at him like there's a blink thing, like, you know, watch me. I'm in, you're out. And that really kind of freaked me out, you know, like in terms of just different societies and how people socially engage these questions. I've never really done the project since. Um, it evolved from this earlier project because I have an interest in rubber stamps. And it's weird. You know, my parents wanted me to do a civil servant. And my first studio was in my parents' office next to them playing with all the things on the table and I never realized what a fetishistic obsession it was. I think the first person who pointed that out to me was somebody who I think shares the same obsession, which I think is Louis Kamnik, so he uses a lot of this kind of bureaucratic, uh, the arsenal of bureaucracy, so to speak. And um, So for me, it's kind of fascinating that I use that, that equipment but to find sort of critical um, concerns or, or to find creative levels which is the complete opposite of my sort of, sort of familiar vision or, or, or path, you know. Um, so it's just other versions of the, the project. The other one that you saw on the ground, which I did actually that is very quickly before I move on, um, I, I started creating these sort of environments, you know, where these things, but if you look at it very carefully, all of the runaway slaves are spreading out, which is very sad. And all of the businessmen running with the briefcases are going in one direction. And um, I mean, I've been asked to do this installation in a number of locations over the years. And 
when I was thinking about it, if you look at islands in the Caribbean, maybe anywhere, you find if, if you have 2% of the population, if you control of 50% of the deposits in the bank, or, and if you have 50% of the people with more than 12 years of education leaving the country and never coming back, then it kind of opens up all these questions about what is an island? What is its social condition? Because at the, at the end of the day, most of the Caribbean islands were really just industrial, you know, external industrial um, labor camps in Europe um, that were just abandoned and shipped out of the United States for, for after Europe got tired in the Second World War. And, you know, so the, the, the prospect of these locations being um, civil social environments was never kind of part of their purpose for being. Um, which is very different from so, uh, you know, other kind of colonial locations where, for example, an indigenous population may not have been aggressively undermined in the same way. And the same rate of transplanting of people from different parts of the world, you know, uh, was not so much part of its kind of inception. Either, this is a version I did in Birmingham, Alabama, but I won't waste time doing it because I'll just see the back. Um, Around the time I was developing that project, I just got very interested in the floor. I was kind of working on the floor a lot. And um, something strange happened in that I was, I started wrapping sandwiches and thinking about Wonder Bread and the relationship of Wonder Bread. You know, it, it offers extra nutrition, a long shelf life, a kind of, all of these really bizarre things. So, and I'd actually I'd just come back from Denmark, you know, and I see people sticking the national flag in sandwiches on the side of the road and shit like that, right? And, I, I, and a friend of mine came to the studio and started, um, she was from India and she was visiting, and she started singing this jingle about um, modern bread. And apparently, when India became independent in 1948, they introduced slice uh, Wonder Bread, slice Wonder Bread, because the working mother, you know, the new nation, you know, couldn't be home making chapati, right? And um, and it's a kind of more industrial form of food. It's easily packaged, you know. And uh, of course, we know that when the bread was invented in England during the war, you know, the, the, the formula for it. And the, the device to make it into slices was invented by a German in Iowa. So it's really a chore. And, um, and in Trinidad, where I grew up, the two popular brands were was called Wholesome. What does that mean? white bread, <laughs> okay? Um, but in the context of India, um, the two brands, I think one was modern bread, that's what they were really wanted to call it. And then the other brand was Britannia. Okay? So both of these implied, you know. So I went to school as a child, you know, with that kind of bread, you know, like that kind of industrial bread that's folded up. And the way of folding it with that band on the top is actually called the English bread. And um, the kids from other ethnicities would have more on the food, you know, like the guys who are coming from an Indian background and have like rotis and chapati, they can't wrap so much of it because of the geometry. Or the guys who come from more traditional kind of afro queer backgrounds or whatever. So there's kind of thing where I'm the one sitting there with the geometric bread and the cheese paste and everything because my parents are the civil servants and I'm in this kind of middle class space. And of course, this can fit in my structure of life, you know. And I started thinking about North Korean military parades, uh, Canadian housing schemes, and the kind of middle class housing schemes that are very geometric that I myself was found, you know, growing up in the 60s after independence, because we became independent in 1962. And it opened up all these questions about the promise of mobility, of self life, and this notion of what we call in the Caribbean flag in in other words, independence isn't necessarily something you fight for, something you, you know, it's something you just get because nobody wants you here. And you get a flag, a passport, and you get a plot to go out and do something and get out, you know? And, um, but it doesn't really bring in any of the real questions of sovereignty or, or you know, so, which is ongoing. So, uh, this piece, uh, I've done a couple of, it's a piece of kind of, is one of those kind of pieces in your career that has generated a lot of critical text. Uh, and I thought this piece would never happen again. And I was actually just showing you a still for a version I did in Berlin in 2013. The first version of it was done like in, 
I don't know, 2002. I'm, I'm, I'm hinting at something by sharing sketches along the way, and I'll catch it later. This is the German version. Well, I'm, I won't spend a lot of time. It also comes with a video um, projection and, um, and, a, and a kind of multi sound channel. And on the channel, I found this remarkable radio broadcast from the 60s in which these two activists are trying to train people how to sing the national anthem properly. Proper. An anthem written in 1962, but it, it's sounding like it was written in 1980 or something. And, um, and at the same time, um, the, what do you call it? The, the, the program that's introducing the, the proper way to sing the anthem has a fragmented music from the Nutcracker Suites when you think, you know, who's the broken person, you know? And so it's a lot of complicated things that you have to negotiate with the people. Um, and then I realized I was stuck on a bread theme for a while. And I started working on this project that came from this photograph. Um, this is a photograph in the 90s of a politician leaving a news. And I'm giving you a little insight into the kind of way that I kind of approach projects. A politician leaving a press conference in which he's giving you that smug, no comment look. But what struck me about it is that there's a character from, that when I was growing up in the 70s, uh, a kind of Philippine James Bond. I don't know if you all got the same B movies here. His name was Tony Falcon, all right? And he had a see through shades at a, on a machine gun with a silencer, right? And he was a Kung Fu expert. I mean, what more could you ask for? And um, he was agent 44X or something. I think he even tried to go up for election. I mean, the real person in the last kind of 10 or 15 years of the Philippine you know, political process. And um, so this politician had that look, and I just kept thinking, man, he's looking really cool in a nice car, shades and everything. And I heard myself saying, like, in a 70s B movie, you know, like, if I have bread and wheels, I'm good to go, you know? And uh, that evolved into me taking bread and taking it on the street and rolling it around and photographing it. And that evolved into all these installations that I did in Chicago. It's a whole complicated thing. I had to find loaves of bread, dry them in an oven, paint them with lacquer, fine wheels. I even did ones with tricked out wheels, you know, like a hip hop version. You know, um, and it was getting out of control. And I, it, it comes with a video. I mean, a lot of these projects are, you know. Uh, and then, but, you know, I'm doing all these projects, and then I kind of went through a, a strange thing where. A curator came to visit my studio, and because of these projects, but then he kept saying to me, "Yes, I'm seeing the research piece. Where is it coming from?" You know, what? And I have copious uh, notebooks and sketchbooks that I do all the time. And he started asking me if he could dismount one of my sketchbooks and show it. I was terrified. I mean, I'm skeleton, I'm not going to go through this. Paranoia, you know, <laughs> everything, right? And I said, go ahead and do it. But when I gave him permission to do that, it really interfered with my life. It was something that was private, speculative, kind of tentative, suddenly took on this performative quality. And um, I mean, I've always believed very strongly in dreams because I feel in my own practice, even when I was trained to be a dream, I made a joke talking to, I think, India or someone you know, I was in art college in the US, right? Maybe in the US. You know, when Americans were kind of enamored by I was in a painting school, right? Some painting school. And you know, everybody was enamored by German expressionism and what you as sexy as me or what she was or whatever. And suddenly American secret news to German were like writing German words and like they were doing these big eighties kind of kind of masculine size painting, you know, and, uh, and, and there's some Americans don't pronounce T, because I was in this department where everybody was walking around cleaning, you know, and I just felt like I wanted out of it, you know, so, you know, there's a kind of way which I, <laughs> it's very complicated to me, but I suddenly realized in my own practice, I really have a strong interest in drawing, something about drawing 
defies monumentality. It takes on a texture around the speculative, the tentative. Like when we read things by Benjamin about you know how drawing has this kind of you know traces this guy. You know, so I, so I start, and then I thought, look, this guy is not my spectacle. So he needed to be into a spectacle. Then I'm going to just very self-consciously start drawing with the awareness that people will see them. And um, a series we draw called the Tropical Night Series. It's very coded. There are like 400 drawings in the series. And the drawings are about 9 inches by 10 inches. So it's about a little bit smaller than they appear here. And it became a kind of way to rinse out vocabulary and to kind of figure out new vocabularies. And it became a kind of staging point for new projects to jump out from the thing. And how it works is that every time the project is shown, it's just put up with paper clips and it changes. So there's no one way. It changes as I add new drawings and it changes based on where I happen to be shown. So I've shown it in about three or four locations and I've been working on it now. A lot of these projects I work on them so this was first shown at the Brooklyn Museum, but if you see the documentation of that, it's a completely different arrangement. And like you see the Great Lakes Zoo, you want to see it on the Great Lakes of Coachella, you want to do it in Martinique, and so on. And I have this idea for it in the future that I would actually like the public to rearrange it. Because one of the most fascinating things is when I was installing it in New York, a lot of the workers were people from the Caribbean, and they would take it, take it over. They say, no, that can't go next to that. You've got to put this next to that. And, and, but the problem is you're dealing with curators and conservators, right? No, people can't touch this. No, it has to stay there. I mean, if, you, if anybody ever saw the Tate installation, it was really funny. Because at the Tate, what they did is they, didn't, they were afraid that nobody would, that someone would come up to it and pull a drawing and go off with it. Right? Because it's the equipment that's in the museum. So what they did is they put a guard in another room and they put a line on the ground and the guard had to sit there in another room but looking across so that everybody raises up their hand and leaves so that the drawing, the guard is in another room. You know, you know, so you got a line of vision there. So I haven't really found the ideal way to do that. Um, but out of it has come many of the projects in the um, And then they wanted to, I'm just show a couple of stories I mean, this one, uh, if I ever see this reproduced again, I'm going to fall over. You know, but a lot of people have been attracted to this project, and um, it's opened up quite a lot of people to come to it. I believe. This one is about how high a wall should be for you to see the cement. But high enough that it's uncomfortable to stand on. It's a whole kind of matter. That's one version. I'm not sure. I think this is the Tate Liverpool one that was in the Afro Modern show. And I could go through a couple of them. You know, that's a dog peeing in the first one and then um, something like a canvas that stays kind of very And this is actually the first drawing of the whole series. Uh, I, I was kind of it started off with this idea from Goya. It was like a reinterpretation of Sato and Gazelle in its way. And the idea came when I was in Crete. And one of my trips to Haiti, just looking at the scale of the problem, I was like, you know, I thought about, you know, what, what, you know, what can I see? And this is just an example of how it picked up. In different regions. I'm very into music. I've done a couple of music projects, but I'm not going to go into detail. But, um, you know, I grew up obviously on soca and then in the dance world, too, you know, so there's a kind of way in which sometimes it is. The vocabularies of those things come to into my practice. And um, so these words kind of allude to things, but I, I, I want to get past the drawing and sort of bring us to the original. This is one of my fun projects. I did this project in, um, I started it in the States, and then I brought it to kind of ultimate conclusion in um, Johannesburg at the Sun Station. In 2011, there are a couple of reasons in it, but I, I'm always obsessed with making things that can take up space. 
with the most limited amount of information. So for me at this point, there's a very specific part where where the stamps of this Akira bench are two pieces of paper, a mini stamp. And then I just made some little I was thinking the idea for this game on a trip to Holland or somewhere. Uh, just to give you an example of where you know how my head kind of came into this thing, where there was a little bit of extra funding in the project. So the creator came to me and said, "I'd like to give you guys a little bit of money. If this money is being spent, then it goes back into the budget, right? And you've come in under, you know. So why maybe I'll just give you the money." Losing money. Yeah. So he kind of said, but the only problem is I have to go to the market. It's closing off the bank. And I was thinking, I don't want to have any cash in my hand. So I said, well, is there a Western Union around that I could go and sort of pay him for the cash in my hand? He said, oh, no, this is Holland. We don't have these kinds of things. I said, well, that's an American thing. You know? So I, it was really interesting how projects come to mind. Right? So I then walk around in the Institution, and there's like a kind of guy there mocking from underneath there. And, and I said to him, Western Union. And he said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then I have to run back to the curator and say, Let me go to Western Union. So I do the middle of Rotterdam. It was a massive um, Western Union, and the whole world there, you know, the money is going off to families and whatever. And the only sort of, you know, Dutch person standing in um, in the Western Union place is the curator. And, <laughs> and everybody's watching him, like, what's he doing in here? Right? And then he's going like, shit, I didn't know this was happening at all. Where, where, where did all the money go? And then I started thinking like, about this Little Gestures project because there's two, you know, three, so many levels of globalization. I mean, the Caribbean being the sort of first site for European expansionism and so on. It's the first place in the world where we have um, Populations transplanted to these labor camps. All these European um, kingdoms at the time had them to work out how their boats must pass, how their goods and services must move back and forth. That's the grand kind of, you know. Then there are the pirates and then there are other kind of people who run away. And then I cut people who are over the sea, right? moving around the country, and all they have is their skills, their tools, and their desires. Moving from place to place. And then I saw this really amazing statistic on Slack where they were saying the smallest amount of people crossing borders on the planet are people trying to enter the US and the US. Most of the border crossings are happening in the US. So I couldn't believe the percentage. And because if you're looking at CNN and the BBC every day, you'll swear the whole world is happening in Africa, Western Europe, and the United States, and it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as, as tragic as what we were seeing, right? And uh, so this project was me, the little bench, which was a bench that I've always seen growing up. They had them here to Europe, a large kind of country version over in there. But the P rounds are little bench that, you, that people use to sell things on the side of the street, to do agriculture, you know, to do a little handy work around the house. And I was in Port au Prince on a second visit. I saw a little boy with a shoe shine kit walking around with a beautiful little girl. And I told him I wanted to buy his horses. And we had a battle for a week as to what the price would be. You know, because of course people say if you give him five dollars, he'll take it. But I just want to give him some back. I want to be I, I just want it. I don't want to use it for those cars. I just want to have it and look at it at home. I eventually got it for like about fifty US, but it was the most frightening encounter because when I, the guy told me I cannot openly hand him the 50 US dollars, so what I had to do is fold it into like a square this big, and then slip it into his hand and say, give me the dollar. Because he actually, one day he went home and made a brand new one with no texture, no, you know. And I said, no, I don't want a brand new one. I don't want a brand new one. I went to back there and said, okay, this brand new one is really good. I said, well, you buy it for me, you know. You know, of course, it's a hard concept to convey. You know, he's like, yeah, you can't believe it on that. You know, you just saw it. You knew. I said, yeah, right. So, but of course, 50 US dollars, I mean, it's quite clear and I didn't know that anything was true. So, when I give him the 50 dollar note in his hand, I was told to pull it in a certain way. He looks in his hand like this and he sees the five views. 
and he just drops the, the bag and runs. Like, and I see him disappear away. Like, I mean, like a life or death kind of run, right? So I was like really freaking out, you know. And then the, um, you know, the interpreter said to me, please let him run. Because you know, a bigger boy will slap him up and take him. So he's trying to get to a safe place. They got a lot of money to pay for his care and stuff like that. So it was a kind of very emotional, kind of weird thing. So the bench just sits in my studio. I thought, okay. But then I started drawing. You know, and then I started putting on this rubber stamp and kind of pulling it off. And, and it turned into this kind of there of, of, of people. So it was a kind of metaphor for people moving all over the place. Like they're living by their dreams and all that. And this little gesture said that was my, my little way of talking about an alternative kind of global activity. And it's just a concept of a big just taking it for what you get. And I love it. I made it for something. Uh, I, I started this Made in China thing. It's um, because I'm always buying rubber stamps. I started noticing in the rubber stamp shops at home, these Made in China stamps. And I couldn't figure out what they were about. Started making some inquiries, and what I found out is that Trinidad has a trade relationship, a trade treaty with China, where if you're importing manufactured items, you don't pay the same tax. So um, the suitcase traders that go to the free zones in Venezuela and Curacao and whatever, what they do is when they go, they rip the labels off all the clothes, and then they buy these made in China stuff. Stamp on it so they could bring it in and not be subject to the same, um, you know, tariffs and whatever in China, right? Uh, that really was kind of fascinating. And it goes back to my Chinese dealers in Denmark. And we had gone through this whole period where, and it's happening everywhere now, where, you know, the Chinese have their own kind of process of diplomacy, which is how they handle food and so on. And Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean islands and the parts of Africa and places that have been in the last couple of years, Chinese things have been happening there. You know, you've been listening to what, you know, Ai Weiwei and all these guys are talking about. And uh, so I, I designed this box. It was my Made in China box. And um, and it was a kind of a tongue in cheek thing. And the politician standing in the box using the Chinese name. But he doesn't know whether it looks like the box that if, if you're going to hang yourself in it, you can pick it out from all these big kind of silk boxes. So it's a very, very dualistic image. And uh, I didn't know where it would go. And then I did a kind of installation with it, which is what on the video that was where I put it in a space and I told people that they were well dressed and they stand on it. And I photographed like 200 people standing on this movie China box. And I, I haven't even shown the piece yet, but I, I like that piece. I know that what it was about. Um, I'm going to race fast, but it, it kind of takes you where we are now. My mother lives close to the forensic center. And, you know, a lot of countries in the Caribbean right now are going gun crazy. You know, I live in Port of Spain, you know, there's two and four meters of it. I mean, maybe compared to Palaka, it's like a whole lot more unlikely. But in a small society, you know, that's shocking. And if you look at some of these statistics in the neighborhoods where it's happening, it would almost be the same statistics now as we have for Syria in the Caribbean. You know, and it's mostly over patronage and also just drugs. It's just state pumping cash into these neighborhoods to undermine the communities and to curry favor to get votes. And gangs have evolved around controlling the government patronage. You know, uh, so it's become a very, very dangerous and incendiary kind of situation. And um, so over the years, when the situation has escalated and become worse, uh, around the time when there's all this thing about the tropical and all that kind of thing which is there, well, this is just a tree in the south. Okay. But what this is actually is the tree outside of the forensic center. And you only know this tree if you have a relative that's been murdered. And uh, you can then you have to go and wait under this tree with the press for them to interview you and try to get stories, right? So, I have to drive past this every week to visit my mother, and and and, um, and it suddenly occurred to me that, well, you'd only know if you know. So there's a kind of weird ambiguity about that tree, right? And 
the, the people that know that tree or the population are, in a sense, living with it change. But then the kind of notion of the tropical tree, so what's really creepy about this tree, as I kind of thought about it more and more and more, is that you realize it's a much larger tree. And it's cut up and it has to stick its trunk. You know, and they keep trying to cut it through the trunk, and they keep trying to burn it through the trunk. <laughs> so it, it, there's a kind of, you know, natural or life form of existence of the tree and what it has to do. And then one day I decided to go and stand with the people and say, well, of course, everybody's watching. Who are you? Who do you know? And then the journalists are watching me. But nobody knows that I'm there. Except the people who know why they're there. And then I realized, oh my God, the wall behind it is the police shooting range. So here you have people going to, you know, tell, you know, identify bodies or have bodies released that are dying from gun violence in the city. And right behind that wall, Police are emptying out rounds of ammunition. So you just constantly jump the wall. And I have to get over this. You know? <laughs> so I don't know where it's going, but I have this obsession with this tree. And, um, and the obsession evolved into a series of drawings that um, I showed in New York. And I've been thinking a lot about cash economies and why it is places like that have oil and such a massive cash flow. Are in this cycle of violence, um, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Trinidad, whether it's Mexico, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's Lagos, Nigeria, you know, why? And I've been reading all of this stuff about it's not so much because in places where there's really staggering poverty, you don't have the same kind of violence. You can create some political violence, you know, a little bit of gangsterism is there, but nothing to match Mexico or, you know, Saudi Arabia, where it's oil and it's possible to send them black people. Which we also have, you know, but in 1990, a small group of Islamic rebels trained in Libya invaded our parliament. So we had to have these rallies here in Libya. I have a son who's 15 who makes a rally awful joke. There's a woman on the BBC called Liz Dusak. So she's always in um, those kind of battles everywhere. So one day my son looked at me and said, Dad, if Liz Dusak comes to Trinidad, we should run to the supermarket and buy some. You know, so obviously, oh my God! You know, how did you, you know, how did you put that together, right? So, um, so this series, I'm not going to just. I started doing the Bible for the first time, and the Lao Kun series started, which I showed in New York in 2013. Lao Kun is the guy that said, you know, to the, to, you know, to the, um, you know, not to let the, not to let the Trojan horse in. The term, you know, so don't take gifts from the Greeks comes from that. So in my mind, I started thinking about all the pipelines, you know, the dead bodies, you know, the cash flow, the oil flow, the blood flow, and um, and the world works in funny things. I I was driving home one evening, and right next to where I was living, you were not there, and I just pull up at the same time with the police, and all I could see in the dark, you know. Sneakers, you know, clock shoes, and there. And it's this weird thing. I have a friend who works for the police, and he told me this weird theory. He said, The left, whenever you find bodies, when you have to go to collect bodies, the left shoe is always missing. <laughs> He's kind of superstitious. I don't know. So I always got caught up. He said, Yeah, I don't know where it is. You know, anytime I find a shot body or somebody gets knocked down, Something about spasms or things, or the, the left shoe is not going on. Or it's, it's, or it's always coming on. So I started doing all these drawings, you know, with the left foot, the right foot, and the right foot, you know, and all of these kinds of things. And, and, and thinking that the tubes you're seeing are kind of were the, um, you know, the silicone bit heads that are going down to suck out the oil and release the gas. And the legs. And um, there are other kind of things going on there. I don't have to go into that kind of thing. Um, the whole thing led to this project called the arrest. It was a light box installation in Nani Park with the Betsy Hotel uh, Commission. And I was listening, I, I work a lot with music, and I, I was thinking a lot about the lyrics of the popular songs, the Soka songs. You know, so put your hands in the air, put your hands in the air, go to the right. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking, 
situations, right? Dictatorial, right? This is what happened. You're being told what to do, how to move, how to bend. And I said, do I just like this? And uh, why would they? You know? So I kind of designed this whole series where I use the lyrics of the song. So the first drawings in the series were basically me composing these kind of so jump to the right, put your hand up. Because if your hands are up, that's one thing. If your hands are out, that means I'm you know? And I went through the whole thing. And then I had this thing about terrazzo, camouflage, and a drop of blood. You know? And the serpentine shape to the silicone difference. The thing about the traps that are shaping countries, independence, utopia, and, um, you know, all, all of these traps. And I'm trying to work my way through it. And so that's how it worked. And the, the series was called The Arrest. I, I had no sense of all the things that were going on in the US right after the real things that happened in the US were kind of in a certain space, right? For some of the drawings. And um, I, I, I love that Galvani illustration of the scientific one. You know, where you connect the electrodes to a dead frog and the legs kind of blow up. So I'm also thinking about <laughs> so, you know, and I'm really thinking about how we all find ourselves in this kind of because it's, it's like it's not just about the place. Nobody likes them to do it. You know, they come out and they just fly around and they're showing you all of it, and nobody's listening. You know, uh, it's crazy, and that evolved into these insects. You know, like because. The trick when you see a kind of wicked insect, like I said before, you only really see it for half a second and then disappears and there's some crap. And then you don't know where the head is, where the tail is, it's got the body, you know. And, um, but the legs of these things became, you know, gas pumps. Uh, a very important political figure was assassinated um, last year, a woman who did a bin at the time, the Attorney General. Um, so I had these lady shoes, you know, I did like this lady shoes. And this notion of everybody being tangled up. But what happened with the series, I abandoned the soca like lyrics and I kind of went more into the, um, I just started rambling. So I kind of like Dostoevsky kind of notes from underground, kind of blah, 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 you know. And, but the thing about it is I wrote down these thoughts. The next line almost obscures them, you know. So even though I put everything down, <laughs> you know, you try to read the text and it just looks like a dream. And that kind of way in which the text just kind of expresses the urgency of it becoming and the kind of narrative that's not very clear um, began to intrigue me. And then I had to get myself into this kind of head space, you know, like a freestyling rapper, rapper life. And uh, that's kind of really interesting. And it's interesting because you know, the Caribbean is known for a kind of lyrical, you know? And I come from a generation where the older generation could make speeches for 10 days. And we were the generation that learned to listen to the speeches of the world for 10 days. So I always have a, I'm extremely self-conscious. I'm a very nervous when I have to say anything, you know? Um, so this becomes a way of doing it, all that kind of stuff. And um, so the series is ongoing. I didn't show um, the whole thing, you know? I, I haven't shown all of them together as well. And I'm working with this thing at the, at the moment now. This is just called Terrazzo Drama. I just go to locations where you see those very, those utopian kind of um, tropical architecture with that kind of terrazzo. And then I just put drips on it. And you don't know what's going on. Is this a home invasion? Or is this, are you just taking the ticks off the door? You just don't really know what's going on. But it, it, it just makes the whole sense of this utopia and you know, in suburbia, it changes. Because, I mean, this is the reality of what we're living in. You know, it's been, you know sort of like I, I have this series that I'm working on. Right? It, it just says, that anybody remember to turn off the outside light? Um, um, so this brings us to this project. Uh, and what happened, basically, is I was last year, I was in Chicago, and I was in the and and I started walking up and down Lake Michigan, you know, just to 
um, for exercise and also a fascinating by the environment. And then it suddenly occurred to me how much the sea looked like, I mean, how much the lake looked like the sea. And some days, you know, with a little bit of sun, it starts to look like any beach in Barbados. Or it actually turns turquoise sometimes, you know? And I found that really disturbing. And um, and I was doing these drawings, and then suddenly I felt, well, maybe I'll buy some um, some gas pumps. <laughs> so I bought gas pumps, and I bought um, uh, who was, and I started filming myself spinning them around, and I started thinking about the Chinese movies that I grew up watching. You know, they, like when you know the the the, the Run Run Shaw logo would come up, and they'd have that horn back. <laughs> And then, and, and then you would see all the guys who were, you know, and, and that was in the Caribbean experience that took over from the westerns for my generation. And the cinema would be filled with Rastafarians smoking weed and down in the front, and they'd be, and then when the guy goes like, this, ah, Mantis stars, yes, I, <laughs> I, I really, uh, it's like a weird, you know. And uh, so I acted out all that in the studio. I have this footage, but I haven't done anything. And because then what I would do is I would project it onto the wall and then I would do a kind of shadow thing where I would fight with myself. I would have the gas pump, a little hint of a thing. And, um, and then what happened is that I tried to work with people in the bar and friends and then people were just a bit upset. And then I decided to get back to my own process as it had always been in the past. I just got two guys in the office to go on on Lake Michigan with me. These are just two ordinary office workers. I gave them the pumps and they just started to act like things. And, um, and uh, you know, at first I thought about the helicopter scene in the fucking canal and I, I had I had Wagner. <laughs> I was actually, I had the, the first titles, I had the first song for it. I was actually using Wagner and I, and I was thinking, and I had it sped up. Really ominous, and, um, and then I said, "You know what? No, this is like more like Carter's, you know, some kind of record, weird record in, in Wang Yu or Carter Wong or something." And then, um, and then of course, you know, all the stuff going on in Syria, and you know, and, you know. So what happened is, I was I had to go home when I was working in Fresh, and. There's a well-known sitarist. You know, one of the things that people don't know is that the Southern Caribbean has a very different social structure. You know, in the Southern Caribbean, like a place like Trinidad, 40% of the population is from India. So even though the music in the video, video sounds like Indian music, well, yeah, it's Indian music, but it's actually Caribbean music, you know, uh, because nobody talks about the fact that 40% of Guyana, 40% of Trinidad, very similarly high percentage of Suriname are people from India. You know, and the Indians came to work on the plantations as they are being treated slavery. In conditions that were, you know, quite treacherous, quite awful. So the, the India Indian music is very much part of the reality of growing up in the southern Caribbean. And it's very interesting when people try to construct uh, curatorial enterprises and ideas of the Caribbean, they just lock out that whole kind of fusion uh, and it's quite remarkable. Um, so anyhow, I started, I went to these musicians, a, j a jazz musician and a, and, a, um, and a sitarist, and said, if I played the video, you know, the girl just respond. And they did this beautiful, beautiful improvisation while watching it. And then what happened is right in the middle of when we were recording it, out there, an ambulance happened. On this whole other feeling that, and this is very much a piece in development. I think I would like it to be something live with well musicians, and, and I have a feeling of doing it in sites related to these kinds of enterprises. So I've been talking to people right now, and um, I'm showing it in places like this, kind of opens up thoughts because I kind of see it when you know, so lots of conversations we can have, and that's basically. What brings us to this? Um, I don't know if everybody wants to breathe um, for a minute, but I mean, I think what excites me about some of these projects is that 
I kind of see my work in some ways as in this negotiation that I defined in the beginning. Because I think very often when people think of the Caribbean um, as a place, they kind of think of it more in a kind of anthropological sense, where it has to be a conversation around you know, ethnography, identity, and all of these things. And it doesn't really um, give a lot of space for where the Caribbean fits in the kind of wider global it's just another place where goods and services are being traded. And in fact, it was a place where even the people are not from goods and services <laughs> uh, at the beginning of the kind of whole modern project, you know. And, um, and, uh, and in terms of my own practice, I mean, I, you know, these things are kind of, and I'm also thinking about the fact that I am an artist. I mean, one of those fascinating things about this project that kind of has these kind of kind of B-movie, kind of masculine movie, like Megan shooting, and sort of, is that I am also a practitioner moving across that landscape, and, and, and kind of assembling the, the, this, this vocabulary that I'm very sensitive to as well. So I'm kind of participating in something that actually does a kind of economy that allows people when you tune into it to kind of cross these borders as well. Um, I can pause now if I, if I you know, have a few questions. I could talk about a little bit about the space I run and you know, some of my people's work, you know, the relationship we've been talking about so far, but I think in the conversation about the work, some of the things I kind of want to talk about. But if there was a specific question or a particular I'm more than willing to entertain that. Stop or where am I? Sure. Somebody who comes comes to paint and they just come and jump to you on the very side and then you live and then you get the paint? Yes. No, because because uh, I have the feeling when I have this conversation with uh, that actually they don't want to uh, blame the community. And uh, it's really just, I don't know, and I have this feel, I mean, I have this experience when we were doing this digital transcription exhibition mm -hmm. in the middle of the streets of the city about not being In, in the I mean, I have this feeling that nobody wants to be Caribbean in the sense because we are, we are more more global in the sense that there's a lot of things that we do which is not Caribbean. I mean, Caribbean is something like that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, um, but I mean, that's where I started. I talked about the Caribbean as a nation of life in many societies. I mean, one of the projects I curated a couple of years ago was called Wrestling with the Other, um, in which I tried to kind of see through that project that, yeah, there's this thing called the Caribbean that belongs with those people who trade in what countries. I mean, one of my arguments, for example, would be to say that some of the attempt to kind of curate Caribbean savings in what they do is sometimes people say that these institutions let's say New York or wherever. And I'm speaking very polemically of course, there are many subject pieces of argument. But let's say somebody says there's money to be created in Caribbean. You know, then they kind of invent a Caribbean and they kill this lot. You know, and that which sounds like something like oh everybody starts throwing their hands up in the air and this is so wrong, why did they come and visit? Why did they do look more carefully, why you do more research. And then I said, but, but that is what the Caribbean is. It's a, it's a kind of fiction. And I don't know when Columbus was in that, uh, there, sorry. <laughs> you know, he, he basically came and saw a bunch of islands, he gave it another name, he wrote his letters back, he said there were elephants and tigers, and, you know, and he created a fiction that got him more money. You know, and the Caribbean has always been a site of exchange. 
you know, uh, for those kinds of transactions. In fact, when when the Caribbean is miscurated, it just means that the fiction continues. You know what I mean? And from what people in the Caribbean have engaged over the years, when are we going to talk? You know, when are we, in other words, I think that's the struggle that um, curators and writers have had for engagement for the Caribbean. You know, the Caribbean is in a funny place. You know? we're, we're all, we're sort of like, we're after the past, never the truth is coming. You know? So there's a kind of way in which, um, and then there's some real irony with all these things. You know, because there's some really fascinating artists in that Caribbean region. Like somebody like Stanley Brown. You know, he is a kind of visible, invisible presence. And one of my speculations with that is, you know, could lie. Be a black man too soon to go and be part of this kind of conceptual movement of color and black studies in history. And then there's something really more fascinating in the world right now. And it's called Christian Black Studies in America. And it's based on that kind of pure girl black based in black narrative. You know, different relations to collaboration with the Sea Park. I mean, I know it's family, I like her, it's family girl, but it's a kind of and that generation thought. Yeah, I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to sort of have that kind of experience. I mean, because I mean, because when I was in Europe, it was the late 60s, and I was graduating to the art world in the two blocks of the city, so you know, I remember going you know, to kind of get a director in gallery to explain me what was to do, and to be kind of, you know, and what I was going to try to do, and I was, you know, and, you know, and the guy asked me, like, what fascination do you do? You know, um, you know, the world has really changed. Um, you know, so I think that when I hear people talking about the Caribbean in that way, I, I kind of understand the anxiety. You know, the bottom line is, what's the deal? You know, that Caribbean that they're talking about, they should forget about. It. That's their Caribbean. Let's talk about these things, the other Caribbean. There's a singular Caribbean, and I think those are common questions. For Deal with with all the baggage of you know past colonial and black colonial. You know, so I, I I wasn't part of that conversation in Holland, but I think that that conversation in Holland was carrying some of the same irony. If you understand what I'm saying, you know, um, I'm then discussing it. You know, so it's very complicated. You know, I don't mean that like I'm criticizing. I'm just saying this is the thing. You know, um, you can. You know, And there's some fascinating things that happen when you have these migratory um, situations. Because I'll give you an example. I met an artist from, well, he was, he'd never been to Barbados before. The parents of Barbados. She grew up in Newcastle on the Hudson. And what happened to her was her grandmother died. And it was one of the first times she had been to Barbados as a, as a viable artist. And her mother's dressing table was arranged in a certain you know, I can't remember the actual details, so I don't know if it's like this or blah, blah, blah. But I mean, it's, well, what I'm saying is that she said to me that her dress, the dressing table in her mother's house was always peculiar. You know, it had certain little features, certain kind of galleries and little statues and so on. And it kind of underscored something about her difference. And then she said that she went to Barbados and she started to know all this stuff. It sent it. And then when she arrived in Barbados and went into her grandmother, grandmother's house in Castle she said, oh, you know, there's this is where he comes from. Right? And um, so there's a kind of way in which a lot of work, I don't think um, Caribbean art comes to where other Caribbean artists live behind. And I think the old narrative of trying to create bonds and 
is kind of impressive. It's the same fiction. Because the fiction wants to place us within a specific geography. Now, I don't want to be naive about that, you know, because I don't want to get into that kind of sort of, how do you want to call it, neoliberal kind of passivity. Yes. Because there is politics on the floor, you know. I mean, I don't want to say, you know, I've heard him to come, I said, God, you know, you know what I'm saying? And everybody needs to be blown off of the radar or whatever, you know. Now, what is it? Gun violence and the spy might come to this, which is happening a lot in the various countries. Um, so there's a kind of way, and of course, it would be good for work happening within the island to produce some kind of awareness and some change in those kinds of things. But I feel that there's also, you know, it also has the yeah, idea you know, the challenge of coming out from this journey or experience that's completely different from what was born in London or what parents had to do with you know. So and it is how all of those stories come together. Um, in terms of the couple of writers that I have um, that they kind of to the Caribbean it would be more than just a geographical location, it would be a kind of a critical disposition. And I think for me personally when I think of contemporary because some people sometimes ask me, how do you do an essay? How do you write it? How do you create it? It's a feeling, yes, it does. But I think that a lot of contemporary artists have a kind of different way. Everybody that's making an essay is not going to uh, or that's seen the kind of history in which that they're engaging in. You know? Whether it is dialectically or whether it is dialectically, they're engaged in some kind of different it's opening out to the urban past, producing awareness in some kind of moment. So to me, um, there's something inherently curatorial about the kind of work that I do. Right? Um, and I'm, of course, it's not a unique answer. There are like Boris Blair, even, even the oldest guy in Africa, who kind of considers these kind of questions. You know, so, but I think coming out of our reality, those questions. Because we don't have all of these institutional frameworks. We don't have all of these people who are being seen as the trash of the same thing. So, in some ways, coming back to the idea of, you know, if you're out in the open, you can be the same kind of thing you can do it. Am I going to waste my energy by avoiding the dialogue? I don't know. I mean, it's a very complicated thing. I mean, I, I'm fascinated sometimes when I, I, I show the work of Emerson and I think to that also. What the work means to some people, and what they're trying to get at, and what kind of story or journey or what kind of awareness they're trying to get people to have, and what are their jobs, and what are the ways, you know. It's very complicated. I'm, I'm not into this, oh, this Caribbean thing, it's not, not subscribing to some kind of Maybe I don't mind being Caribbean, you know. Just for Mr. Tony, you know. <laughs> I have something at stake. There's a writer that I'm very interested in called Lloyd Nelson. I think he's one of the founders of the um, of the New World Movement. In fact, when I first came back into the Caribbean, I was really very bad time to spend time with this guy. I had written a couple of things, and he was like, this guy is so bad. Because he saw something I wrote, and he saw that maybe a page in my journal you know, for months, you know, months and months. A speculative story, but he has this term about epistemic sovereignty. You know, that text is a seminal text. His generation, the late fifties and early sixties. Um, you know, kind of Bowie, but I actually did this kind of thing. I didn't know it through the text. I learned it through him. How he sort of instigated in me. You know, gave me the sort of critical space to talk about it. Yeah. I wonder if you would hone in on two motifs which you which popped up in some of the pieces. Um, the wall and the rubber stamp. And I was thinking how they're, they're both kind of motifs that they're kind of they're kind of symbols of a certain kind of master discourse. 
which is now already kind of bygone, they're like, you still get a stamp in your passport when you travel, but you know that what really counts is that it's been swiped yeah. uh, digitally. Yeah. And the wall as well, I don't know if you know Wendy Brown's work, uh, uh, yeah. Walled states, waning sovereignty. Uh, for her, the condition of these walls that are springing up, like between between the U.S. and Mexico, Palestine, and saying that they're not really functioning as walls. They're not really keeping people out. That they don't perform that function. They're more symbols of what a wall. It's more the symbol of the biblical wall. That that. Uh, it's, order to it's more to make a statement. It's almost a kind of sign of itself, and and the rubber stamp kind of felt a bit like that as well. It's like it becomes, uh, it becomes pertinent, or, or it has a different kind of pertinence now that it's become a sign of itself, and it's kind of slipping into a, yeah, kind of a bygone era. It, you feel like it's not completely appropriate, and yet it's still. The very fact that it doesn't serve the function that it served before, whereas before it was kind of the signature of the master, we're not going to sign everything, we're going to, we're going to stamp it. Now it's everything's done digitally, but it's it's still there. So why is it still? There? Why are they still being used? When um, interesting question. I hadn't thought of it in that way. It was just a sign, a sign of something, a trace of. And of course, I was looking for all this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, my training before I registered to be a I started to look into the work that I was Because I'm always into the political process. So I went through this all of this repetition. And I was looking for all of this. So, yeah, it's a very interesting question about it because it has to do with the but I think it still has, I mean, even when they, like you say, it's taken on a kind of ritualistic thing. You know, it's like going to the funeral parlor and you have to die. But, you know, the name of the gods, the name does come from the summit. You know, it happened to a friend of mine. You know, like their car broke down outside in Africa. And so they couldn't move and they're in the car. And the guy comes to them and says, You have to do this because you have to do this. And they 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 have to do this. And so it means that there's a kind of dichotomy between the first time and the second time. So there's kind of this conception of the I have a question that's a little bit specific. Um, I really like the first project that you were showing, uh, the one you did in Copenhagen yeah. later in Haiti, um, and especially how much it changes depending on the location. Mm -hmm. Given that in Denmark it was so much, almost a fast, um, in a way, like getting even, like maybe given a taste of their own medicine and having to adhere to this bureaucracy of that obviously Western Europeans don't really have to go through in the same way that people like us have to. Yes. Um, and at the same time, when you take it to Haiti, how much it changes, how it really becomes a completely different project. And at the same time there, you have the context of the island and how Haitians are, in a way, um, pushed apart to their side of the island and not wanted within the Dominican Republic, so it has that context as well. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like the, it becomes the privilege then to be able to access to access the space. Whereas in Denmark, there was more of that, um, of making them go through the hassle of, 
of that bureaucratic process where I can hate it seems that it's not so much about bureaucracy anymore. So I don't know if you can just refer to that a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's just what we're going to do. We're going to figure out how to How do I get through this? And what is that? We are going to do this. And then it got to a point where I started counting because you would pick your way to it. So the keys, so the coins, red. You know? So, <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, it was really funny because, you know, so the guys would be trying to, like, scrape their deal on the car, you know, and I'd be trying to, like, you know, like, change the car, and, you know, it became a game, you know, um, of, um, and that's kind of the pressure of, 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 of the game. But, I mean, but there's another question fronting that, which is about, um, you know, so the team talks about sort of the other you know, the glide across cultural landscapes, you know, because in the old kind of universities, kind of like the old institutions that were kind of like built in the old school, and um, if you have a thing like in the eye, then you want to slide it like that. You need to go across um, a kind of social and cultural landscape. You want people to indulge in it, but I think we choose kind of what we're going to choose to become, you know, well driven, um, critical aware. But you know what I mean? It's 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 um I think in my own kind of personal writing and kind of life, that is what strikes me is that when you have say an artist who is who's been screening for like maybe one year or two years, um then as more kind of internet comes and there are more curators um people who go and come away to suddenly Alive, you want to send them to back to them, and then they do like that whole kind of country, you know, like kind of thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. There's a certain sort of movement of people that say they want to do this kind of thing. Um, but they don't know it's ever going out there. Because the internet has sped up these things in the public spaces. And, and it happens, you know, I discovered something really weird in my life. Uh, my great grandfather, my grandmother's family, died in a police accident at the tail of the night. And my great my, my grandmother was born at my nine. And then 100 years later, a young guy doing an internet search in Google is able to get in touch with my mother. And then he discovered that my great grandfather. When he was operating a gold mine in Guyana in the late 19th century, he had a complete separate family than the one he had in Barbados. And then he died. So, you know, so what happened is that they there are pictures of him with them and there are pictures of him with us. And one hundred years later, the grandchild of that situation discovers it and then comes to visit my mother. So then Said a hundred years later because of the internet, you know, because of that. Um, but now that will have to be in two weeks, you know, like in one day. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, there's Facebook. <laughs> you know, and, and all kinds of other situations. Uh, at least in the sector, you know, when you're kind of going to do that. But I think that um, some, some similar things are happening with digital culture. There's suddenly um, bodies of work, critical ideas are falling into you know, are colliding, you know, a new awareness is being created. Um, there's a writer that I had met from a year ago who put out a book called Sacking Country. I don't know if you've heard of this book. It's a 17 year old book. Because she was talking about there was a time when, like, all of these conversations didn't need to be with this teacher and all of this English concern. But she's very active now in, like, translating directly from, say, Indian languages to Korean and, you know, where. So there's all these new exclusions that you know that <laughs> that we're not even to, that English is not 
to our dear millennial friends and ask them not to intervene in the Ukraine language that we have. So, I mean, it's, it's a really fascinating move. But in the visual culture, it kind of is the, the visual of a language that in some ways optimistically defies language in a conventional language. And we literally work through just images and see affinities, not just formal, but thematic. And then you have to then try to kind of investigate to see are they really connected as well as they need to be. Very nice, Christopher. Thank you, Kiraja, as always. Thank you so much. Yes, and, and thank you again for inviting me here and for doing this. Thank you very much.